Hello, friends. Today, I am joined by Dawn Duran. Dawn lives in Maryland with her husband, their two sons, and their dog, Storm. She encountered Charlotte Mason's philosophy 10 years ago and has been following Mason's principles in her home ever since. Prior to taking on her most prized role of stay-at-home wife and homeschooling mama, Dawn worked as a physical therapist, strength and conditioning coach, and Pilates instructor. She leads a local group of scholars in the study of Shakespeare and Plutarch and also teaches classes in health sciences online for Purdue Global University. Dawn enjoys talking all things Charlotte Mason and has been a speaker at various Charlotte Mason retreats. She is passionate about the teaching of citizenship, and her articles on this topic have been published in Commonplace Quarterly and American Essence. She is a moderator on the Ambleson, restating that. She is a moderator on the Ambleside online forum and creates curriculum guides for the CMEC. She co-hosts the new Mason Jar with Cindy Rollins podcast and has created Swedish Drill Revisited to assist homeschool families effectively embrace a forgotten form of physical education. I am so delighted that you're here with us today, Don. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here and chat with you. Well, here at the beginning, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and how you got started homeschooling? Sure. So I've been married for 21 years today, actually. And (laughs) my husband, Gabe, and I have two sons. Lucas is 11 and Gabriel is 14. And I always knew that I planned to homeschool my children, but I didn't actually discuss it with my husband until our first son was born. Apparently, it was something that we talked about in my head, but not out loud. So, but fortunately, when I did discuss it with him, my husband wholeheartedly agreed to my plan to homeschool, and he's always been very supportive while leaving homeschooling decisions primarily in my wheelhouse. So, I began researching homeschooling before our second child was born, and at that time, I just assumed I'd use the school at home model because that was what I was familiar with, and it had served me well personally, but when I started to research, I was so surprised to learn that there were so many different educational philosophies. About a year into the process of researching, I read the Clarkson's Educating the Wholehearted Child, Yes, and I love that book, and it gave me a better vision of what I wanted for our homeschool. And shortly after that, I read Susan Schaefer Macaulay's For the Children's Sake, so I was hooked. And then I began reading Charlotte Mason's volumes directly for myself, and I just, I haven't looked back since. My sons were one and four years old at that time, and so I feel incredibly blessed that I had 18 months at least of immersion in Mason's volumes before I began officially homeschooling our oldest child. And that's, that's it. (laughs) Wow. I love hearing that because I was going to ask, like, if you had always been interested in Charlotte Mason, how your approach to education has, has changed over the years, but you are a fortunate one who had the opportunity to really delve into those ideas and establish those principles. Like I think mom's mindset with homeschooling is so important. And a lot of moms are figuring it out as right. we're also homeschooling. And so yes. it really can be a challenge. So what a blessing that you had that time to like think before you started. Yes, it absolutely was. I have, I, I am forever thankful that the Lord brought that into my, my sphere as I was looking so that I, cause I hear so often of people who start one way and then try to learn the philosophy and, and move to another direction. So I, I have been incredibly blessed. Well, that being said, of course, so you had these ideas, these ideas in your mind and these principles, but then you had actual real children and real homeschooling. (laughs) So I would love to hear, like, how has your thought or approach to home education grown or changed in the years since? Well, honestly, it hasn't changed much because... We have been committed, as you, as we alluded to already, to the CM philosophy since day one. But of course, as I've matured in my understanding of it, and as my sons have matured in their studies, we've certainly tweaked things here and there, but nothing earth shattering. So as I was pondering this question, I thought, I don't really have much to add here (laughs) because we've never really moved beyond our roots in a Charlotte Mason education. And certainly when you have the differences of my, our first child, who was much more academic in, la- in nature compared to our second child, you have to tweak things here and there. But when you're educating by the principle of children are born persons, that was just 
kind of part of what I expected anyway. So it, it hasn't been too difficult. I've just been so pleasantly surprised by how all of this has gone. Not that we've never had challenges, but nothing that really sticks out. And that makes me think when I interviewed Brandy Vensel, I think this was back in like the very first season of the podcast. It may actually have been before I had named the podcast. I can't even remember. <laughs> but, she, but she talked about like this as a misconception with Charlotte Mason education in particular. And she talked about how it, if you think of it as, as if you realize that it's a principle, Mm -hmm. The principles can be applied in many different ways with different children, with different families in different seasons, and you never abandon the principles. Yes. And so a lot of times we think of it as a list of to-dos or a checklist, but if you think of it as the principles, then you really are able to just have those as your foundation and then live in freedom from there. Absolutely. And that's the thing. The principles are not rules. Just like when we look to the Bible, we are not confounded by what we find in it. It gives us so much liberty and freedom within a structure, right? So I feel the same way. Well, I hear this is already sort of like a positive surprise that you found from Charlotte Mason Education, that this principle that you read when your when your little guys were tiny has carried you all these years through. But I would love to hear if there has been anything else, maybe a challenge or another positive from your Charlotte Mason education, or if you think there are aspects of CM homeschooling that might surprise other people, maybe especially someone outside of the Charlotte Mason world. Yes, I absolutely think that that's the case. I, I, I guess just to reiterate, the, the only thing I've been surprised by is how much Charlotte Mason education lives up to the promises when you follow Mason's principles. But I do absolutely know, not just think, that people unfamiliar with the Charlotte Mason philosophy have all kinds of misconceptions. And they're in particular surprised to learn about the way things operate in our homeschool. Most people unfamiliar with the wide array of educational philosophies envision what I initially did, which is just the homeschool um, merely was ho school at home model. And so they don't immediately recognize how much more real learning takes place when, when one's education is steeped in reading living books and bring, that bring us in contact with big ideas, which we then solidify via narration. But, and they think we, they need to see the traditional entries and workbooks, along with the stack of textbooks. But the proof is really in the pudding when you're engaging with children who learn via the Charlotte Mason method. And they're so delightful to converse with because they have such a broad wheelhouse to come from. Like they, they have such a variety of topics that they touch on in their, in their education that they can have a conversation with anybody about anything. And that's just really delightful. And I also think, and you've probably counter this too, that there's that misconception about Charlotte Mason that it's light and fun and entirely child-led. It lacks rigor, but not at all. I've, I've had people when I first started out say, oh yeah, we did Charlotte Mason. But then when my children got older, we needed to get serious. So we switched to whatever. But that tells me they weren't truly familiar with the full depth of Mason's philosophy if they were unaware of the vigorous education it includes for the middle and high school years. So those are the things that I think would surprise people outside of the CM world. Do you know Jamie Marstall? Okay, so she came on the podcast but previously and talked specifically about Charlotte Mason in high school years. Yes. And it, I, if someone is having this misconception and thinking, well, it was great when we were little and we like wandered in the woods or something, but now <laughs> we've got to get serious, you know, right. that sort of misunderstanding. I would highly yeah. recommend my chat with Jamie. Yes, I will have to go back and find it. She's, she's wonderful. She was lovely to talk to. Okay, well, I am very excited to talk to you. Specifically today, our focus is Plutarch. And I'll just give a little background on my own story with Plutarch. For my early childhood, I loved the musical Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> no, I love to hear this. This is so fun to me. I had no idea it was in there. Yes. Oh, it's, it's actually... actually it. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness, Don, you need to watch this now. As anyone listening, like, yes, I understand. Like, you have to watch it with a grain of salt, but it's based on the story of the kidnapping of the Sabine women. The oh. entire plot of the musical is a. It's like set in the West 
of Oregon territory, but uh-huh. it's the story of the kidnapping of the Sabine women. Oh my gosh. And they actually sing songs like read from Plutarch during the musical. It's referenced multiple times. And sort of one of the things is Millie, one of the main characters, when she's married and she's going off to the cabin in the woods with her new husband, is showing him what she's bringing, her dowry. Oh. And she has Plutarch's lives and the Bible. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is so awesome. I'm going to watch that movie this weekend. Yeah, stop everything and watch this musical. Okay. Um, so I love it so much. We actually had my tween girls had some friends over yesterday, and one of them hadn't yet seen this musical. So we corrupted them. So you were, you're got it really fresh on your mind for today too. Yes. Yeah, so great. fresh on my mind. So anyway, so that is sort of like a funny version of Plutarch, like Plutarch's lives in the Bible is, is a line from the, from the musical. <laughs> but later on in That's my fabulous. own, oh, yes, yes, Don, you have to, you have to add this to your, to your watch list. But later on in high school, I actually did read actual Plutarch as well. That was part of my humanity study in high school. I'm very thankful for my, my parents and their, their homeschooling. Um, so I am very familiar in that way with, with Plutarch from my, my past, both sort of silly and a little bit more serious. But I think that Plutarch is kind of a mystery to people. You hear about Plutarch if you're in the CM or classical world, like he comes up, but I think he's still kind of a mystery and a little intimidating to people, especially if they were not fortunate enough to grow up on this musical like I did. (laughs) So I would love, love yes, I would love to like start super big picture first and just explain to us who Plutarch is even is, Mm -hmm. and when he wrote his famous book, and why he did it. Absolutely, but first, I have to say, beyond how much I love that story, and yes, it's on my watch list for this weekend, I am super impressed and jealous that you were introduced to Plutarch in when you were a high schooler, because the first time I heard about him was when I started reading Charlotte Mason's works, and I want to give this big picture, but I want to give a disclaimer first. I am a Plutarch enthusiast, but I am certainly not an expert. My interest arose completely organically through reading Charlotte Mason's works. And so I don't have official training in this area. I didn't study the classics in college or anything like that. But with that said, I've learned a lot about him through my enthusiasm. So Plutarch was a Roman citizen. He was born in the Greek region, uh, region of Boeotia in 50 AD. He was a philosopher and an educationalist with many thoughts on the responsibilities of parents and the training of children, in particular, character formation and citizenship. He wrote to warn his contemporaries what would result if the culture continued to decline morally and that this, and I quote, loss of moral sanity must sooner or later cause national decay. Wow. Wow. How relevant is that to us today? So he wrote a series of essays which are collected into a volume called Moralia, or The Morals, but most famously, he is known for his parallel lives of the noble Greeks and Romans. They were written in pairs of one Greek and one Roman life, followed by a brief comparison between the two, and these works include details of the greatest men of two great nations. But understanding, as you asked, the time frame in which Plutarch wrote his lives helps us understand his rationale for writing them even better. Because at the time that Plutarch lived, Greek civilization had declined and Rome was on the rise. The Roman Empire was undergoing rapid Hellenization, which means that they were intentionally becoming more and more like the ancient Greek culture that they so greatly admired. The Romans found so much to admire in Greek culture and often adopted Greek traditions as their own. And the area of pagan religion is one prime example of this. The Romans co-opted the Greek gods and goddesses and gave them new names to reflect their place in Roman society. And so that's why when we study mythology, the gods and goddesses often have two names, one for the Greeks, another for the Romans. And part of Plutarch's goal in writing his lives was to intentionally compare the great men of Greece to the same of Rome in order to elevate the Romans in the eyes of those who admired the Greeks so much. And another thing that I think 
is important for people to understand when they're reading Plutarch is that in his time period, history was written in the form of what we call today biography. And he is often referred to not just by Charlotte Mason, but by other educationalists and classicists as the prince of biographers. But we can e best understand it even through his own words, because in his life of Alexander, for example, he writes the following, and I quote, for it is not histories that I am writing, but lives. And in the most illustrious deeds, there is not always a manifestation of virtue or vice, nay, a slight thing like a phrase or a jest often makes a greater revelation of character than battles where thousands fall or the greatest armaments or sieges of cities. So in writing the parallel lives, Plutarch relied on the works of historians that are now lost to us. And he also focused on personal details that modern works entirely leave out of the telling. And according to editor W.H.D. Rouse, who edited many volumes around Charlotte Mason's time, most particularly the Blackie's volumes of, Blackie editions rather, of Plutarch's lives that Charlotte Mason liked to use in her schools, Rouse said that Plutarch did this because he knew that a man's character is often revealed by trivial acts and sayings, and character, not history, was his theme. So this is part of what makes Plutarch the right source for a study of citizenship in a Charlotte Mason education, because its emphasis was on character as much as on history. So instead of facts and dates, Plutarch wrote about the everyday lives of famous men of women, the famous men rather, of Greece and Rome, and illustrated that their actions had consequences, whether they be good or bad. And placing such scenarios before students inspires their moral imaginations, allowing them to grapple with ideas which they might not otherwise be exposed to. It's so really fascinating to me because, you know, that approach to history is exactly the way I teach history in my own homeschool, right? We talk, and my, my, I am indebted to my parents who, who taught us history biographically and chronologically. And in my opinion, history only makes sense if you realize it's about people. Yes. Real people, flawed people, often right. complicated people. Right. And so, yeah, I really... It's exciting to me to, to think about the impact that Plutarch had, just even on the way we think about how to study history. Yes, absolutely. I love what you, you said there is that, especially in modern day, people don't understand or they don't respect that people are nuanced. They are not always 100% good or 100% evil, but as you said, they're complex characters. And we cannot totally erase a person's worth by one bad mistake. Yes, um, the Old Testament teaches us that, right? <laughs> amen. Amen. So I love that your parents raised you that way, and it so resonated with you that you continue with it today in your own homeschool. I think that's wonderful. Well, that's already one aspect we can see of Plutarch and his value, but why has he been considered a valuable part of one's education historically? Because this isn't a new idea. This isn't new. To Charlotte Mason didn't invent this. Um, and so I guess, why has he been considered important in education and then what has his impact been over the centuries? Okay, I love this question and I have a lot to say. So buckle Go for up. it. <laughs> so while Plutarch may be an unfamiliar name to modern ears, once upon a time, an understanding of the ancient past was the hallmark of any educated person in the West. A study of classical authors, including Plutarch, was a staple of education that only recently has fallen out of vogue. For example, our founding fathers here in the United States were steeped in the ancients, and Plutarch was primary among them. They knew that looking to the past would help them to shape the future. They learned from the virtuous examples, as well as the not-so-virtuous models that were highlighted in Plutarch's lives. In particular, they admired the democratic ideals of Greece, but they recognized the tyranny of the majority of an absolute democracy that ultimately led to the demise of Greek civilization. And they held the Roman system of government in high esteem, but they saw that the decadence that contributed to the decline of Rome, uh, so they set out to design a system of government that could only be a success if carried on, carried on by a virtuous people. Our founding fathers were so strongly influenced by Plutarch and so well acquainted with his lives that they wanted sets of these books to be bought 
and placed in every library in the new nation, just like you saw in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. It's fantastic. They knew that the noble ideas, the heroic actions contained within the pages of Plutarch's lives were mind fodder for the citizenry. They wanted us to keep these models at the forefront of our minds. So now we can fast forward a couple hundred years and politicians continue to be influenced by Plutarch into the 19th century. I recently learned this. Former President Harry Truman credits his father reading to him from Plutarch Lives as his first source of political wisdom. Wow. And I know. And after leaving the White House, Truman told his biographer, quote, Plutarch knew more about politics than all the other writers I've read put together. When I was in politics, there'd be times when I tried to figure somebody out and I could always turn to Plutarch. And nine times out of 10, I'd be able to find parallel in there. Isn't that remarkable? That blows my mind. Right? Right. And, but Americans were far from the only people inspired by Plutarch. A classicist, C.J. John Akaris, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his name, but he wrote that Plutarch was for centuries Europe's schoolmaster. While imprisoned during World War II, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote the following in a letter home. Father, could you get me from the library Plutarch's Lives? While well, he is in prison, he wants to read Plutarch's Lives. Obviously, he was reading his Bible, too, because right. he was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But. <laughs> and more than 100 years before that, Napoleon Bonaparte was a great student of the ancient biographer. I just love Napoleon's story in this. He, for all of his faults, he was a voracious reader. He had a personal librarian whom he expected to be available to him at all hours while he's traveling during the wars. He traveled with a portable library, among which Plutarch was always found. And in particular, he was inspired by the life of Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. And many historians suspect that Napoleon self-consciously imitated Caesar's practices, such as that of dictating to multiple secretaries at the same time, as well as in the art of military campaigns and empire building and inflicting tyranny. But... <laughs> But historian Will Durant also wrote of Napoleon that, quote, he breathed the passion of those ancient patriots and drank the blood of those historic battles. Bonaparte so clearly emulated the noble lives he read about in Plutarch that a Corsican rebel leader once said to him, there is nothing modern in you. You are entirely out of Plutarch. And Napoleon saw this as a tremendous compliment realizing he had given flesh to the ideas that so inspired him. And the final thing I want to say about Napoleon is that in 1812, his court painter, who was Jacques-Louis David, painted a nearly life-size portrait of him entitled The Emperor Napoleon in His Study at the Tuileries. And we live near Washington, D.C., so we get to visit the National Gallery of Art, and this portrait is on display there. And it is bigger than life-size. It is ginormous, and it is spectacular. And I remember close looking at it closely that like maybe the second or third time I visited it. And I saw in the lower left-hand corner of this painting, you can find a copy of Plutarch's Lives. Wow. And it was inserted in there to show the source of the ideas that inspired him. And I just, I just love that story. I love this painting and how it reflects on him. But while Plutarch is obviously historical in nature, it's not where that book was found in the syllabus of Charlotte Mason schools. Her students studied Plutarch under the banner of citizenship. And citizenship in her schools, the PNEU, wasn't limited to how the nation was governed or the installation of patriotism in the students, although it did include those things. Instead, the study of citizenship fostered the ability to discriminate between a man's actions as right or wrong and inspired ideas of what makes a person a valuable citizen. But Recently, I heard someone describe Plutarch as a library of human character, and I just think that is such an apt description because the lives inspire our moral imaginations by placing before us the life of a real man who made decisions, good and bad, which had consequences for better or for worse. And reading about the repercussions of these choices encourages our students to ponder what these choices say about a man's character. And the heroes in the lives inspire us to greatness, just as the villains serve as cautionary tales for what to avoid or who to avoid when we recognize those character flaws in others around us. 
So Plutarch is masterful in his ability to bring out character strengths and flaws without moralizing or pointing to the message that he wants you to take from your reading. And so it's excellent fodder for our scholars' minds. Great. This is really fascinating that it's in with, within citizenship. And I'm sure I have heard that before, but I didn't remember that. And I liked the way you explained citizenship because I think sometimes people could have an assumption that just means like just rabid patriotism or love for one's own country yes. necessarily yes. to the exclusion of thought or right. nuance. And instead, what I hear you saying is it was really about being able to judge right and wrong, wisdom yes. and foolishness, virtue and error. Yes, she often referred to citizenship as everyday morals. And in fact, that that level of patriotism that you just described, the unthinking patriotism, she warns against repeatedly in her volumes, volumes and she calls it jingoism, which is not a term she made up, but it's that, that unthinking patriotism that my country can do no right or no wrong. And that does not have a place in a Charlotte Mason education because she knew that we had to have an understanding of things beyond our borders. And she was very much a proponent of that. But yeah, I can, Plutarch definitely falls under a study of history, but yet that's not what she used it for. The students in Mason schools always, after they got to a certain age, they always had a stream of history that they were studying. But when they were, re so that helped them when they were reading Plutarch, not to get bogged down in the details, but they weren't using the Plutarch lessons to rehash those historical details. They were focusing on the ideas and character and decisions. So. Okay. Well, I have two other things, what you were just saying. First of all, I mean, Napoleon had his errors, but man, I need a personal librarian, please. Right. You can just follow me everywhere I go. <laughs> Every uh, school mom is like, yes, please. Yes, please. Exactly. <laughs> and then, okay. I don't know. This is like totally a rabbit trail, but Harry Truman's daughter, Margaret Truman is an author. And many, many, many years ago, my husband and I listened to an audiobook of a book she wrote called First Ladies. It was a fab fabulous book. She went through the, the first ladies of the United States and sort of to see the history through that lens. And I, one of the things that was confusing to me at the time is why she chose to do them in parallel lives oh. as opposed to chronologically, but now it's all making oh. sense. That is so fantastic. I need to find that book too. You are yeah. just a wealth of, uh, of wonderful things that I need to find and do. That is so cool. And something that, to read this weekend, Don. That's you got right. your assignments. <laughs> that is so cool. I had no idea. Yes, of course, she was absolutely influenced as much as her father loved uh, Plutarch. She couldn't yeah. fail but have been exposed to him as as he had been when he was a youth. I'm going to have wow. to dig this book back out now Now that I'm, my mind is blown and read it through that other lens. So yes. I'm so excited. Okay. That is so cool. <laughs> it's the science of relations. Everything. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about some practicalities when it comes to Plutarch and our homeschool. Someone's listening and they're like, wow, this all sounds very great, but I have no idea where to start. So what age do you recommend that someone begin including the study of Plutarch in the homeschool? Can we do it with a mixture of ages? You know, I've got five kids, 10 years apart. Can I do it with everyone together? You can, except for the seven-year-old because he's too young. Okay. At least I think so. Now you will come across comments in Mason's works. Uh, there was one stray comment that talked about a child of seven could listen to the life of so-and-so and, -so and through Plutarch and, and understand him. And he might, but um, I personally go a little bit older for that. So students began to study Plutarch formally in Charlotte Mason schools in form 2A, which is approximately fifth grade or 10 years old. And the year before they started to read ancient history, including one delightful book called Stories from Ancient Rome by Mrs. Beasley, because even though, as we talked about, Plutarch fell under the banner of citizenship, it's still helpful to have a handle on ancient history so you don't get lost in the details. And Plutarch is absolutely positively a subject that can be formed with mixed ages. I've led cast classes for my local community in which we have an age range from 10 to 17 years old. They're all reading the same life together. It's so wonderful, especially this past term was just delightful. I had students, the older students that had started off with me when they were quite young, and then I had new students this year, and this was their first exposure to Plutarch. And getting to see how much the older students had matured after doing it year after year after year, and 
seeing how that inspired the younger students, but also how they were able to enrich the conversation with both of their age ranges, um, both sets of their ages, their insights that they had to offer were just fabulous. So it's absolutely not something that you have to add as an individual study for individual children. This is something you absolutely do combined and should. And many parents though, like I once was, they're eager to get their children started with Plutarch at younger ages, but there's really no rush. There's so many years available for students to plumb the depths of Plutarch. And I think that waiting until age 10 brings a bit more maturity with which the student can more clearly recognize the character lessons, which are why we're studying Plutarch. So I did start my oldest child at nine and he was capable of it. But I, with my second child, I waited till after he was 10 and that was a better choice for him. But even so, it might have I, I could have waited till my oldest was 10 too and he would have continued to get as much out of it as he does now, right? Yeah, but I think, you know, so often we get so excited. I mean, we're excited as moms, yes, right? And it's yes. it's not it's not always from this desire to like create our children into some sort of academic, you know, monsters. It's like, we're just so excited and we want them to know all these wonderful things. And I, I think that was an error I made with Plutarch. I mean, you should think, I knew in my own life, I hadn't read Plutarch till I was in high school, um, but I was just so excited several yeah. years ago. I thought, oh, I'm going to, throw some Plutarch into morning time. And, you know, I had some children who were probably in an appropriate age, but it was just a wreck. It was a train wreck. Mm. Nobody was enjoying it. I felt like I kind of ruined their first experience oh, of Plutarch man. a little bit. Like now they think Plutarch, I don't know. I just, you know, wish that I had just waited. If I had just waited a little bit longer, that first experience could have been more positive and set them up for success. So I think it's just, you know, learn from my mistakes. So mothers, you know, like don't push <laughs> too soon. That's true, but don't put that burden too much on yourself too, because you were doing it out of love and desire to make them um, be exposed to this. And I'm sure it hasn't ruined them for um, you to experience the, the wonderfulness of it in the future. Yes. Yes. We have, we have more years to come in our home. That's right. Right. That's right. Okay. And so, I, I, oh, go ahead. I was, was going to say, yeah, I fine. know that moms are intimidated by Plutarch. I totally get that, but it really is a matter of just taking the plunge. The study guides that Ann White created that are available in book form, they're also free online on the Ambleside Online website. They are absolutely invaluable for helping families implement it in their homeschools. And while many parents, this is a key point I make, so many parents say, the language, it's so, so challenging. There's a whole page without a period in it. Like his sentences are so long. And that is true. But while we are intimidated by it, well, maybe not you having been homeschooled yourself, but our children who have been reading these excellent books since they were young, it is not a problem for them. You will struggle, mama, more than they will. I can assure you that the language is not at all problematic for them. So I like to encourage mothers not to underestimate themselves by overestimating the difficulty of Plutarch. It's not our goal to do the teaching. We just put the words in front of them and let them do their work and let the ideas come out. We can't be effective guides in this area of study if we don't overcome our own fear by diving into his works as preparation for the role to which we're called. So I encourage moms just to dive in. And I'm confident, absolutely confident in time that you'll find yourself surprised at how enjoyable the study of Plutarch can be and wonder why you ever felt intimidated about reading him. Now that might not happen in the first three weeks, but in the first three months, three years, I mean, I love. I used to not be able to read more than a page of Plutarch, and now in any one day, and now I can read a whole life from start to finish, and it, it's I, and and I remember very well how difficult it was at first, but it no longer is. So just, just do it. <laughs> I love that encouragement <laughs> and that reminder that if it's hard at first, that doesn't mean it's going to be hard forever. Exactly. So don't quit just because it's hard right at the beginning, right? Keep yes. going. Okay. Well, what does it, even a lesson look like? Are you reading it out loud as yeah. the mom or the teacher? Are the children reading it on their own and you're discussing it? Walk me through what a Plutarch lesson looks like. Okay, I will. And I will also share with 
the with your audience that the way I have learned this is because Charlotte Mason outlined it for us in the appendix of one of her volumes, her third volume called School Education. There are plans for teaching 10-year-olds who are narrating from Plutarch's life of Alexander. So we can generalize how to apply these plans to any Plutarch lesson. But as to the reading, who does the reading? So Plutarch was something that Mason talked about. It's like the Bible in that you will have to make suitable omissions. Like we don't always read everything from the Old Testament to our children, right? Plutarch was very much the same way. When I first got my hands on unabridged Plutarch, I was like, wow, no wonder she said that. <laughs> there were some creepy, crazy stuff in there that I would never want in my kids' heads. So Plutarch was something that the teacher read into the students. Now they could follow along if you have a, a a copy that had suitable omissions. That was why Mason used these Blackies editions in the schools because they had gone through the life and taken out any objectionable material that wouldn't be appropriate for a middle schooler or high schooler to be exposed to or an older elementary school student. Um, and Ann White's guys, guides do, have done that as well for people who are interested in obtaining those and reading from those. She has made those omissions for you. So in those cases, you as the teacher still read aloud, but your students follow along and that way they're getting it through their ears and their eyes as well. But the Plutarch lesson per Mason consisted re really of four steps. First, you set up the lesson by asking the students what they remember from the last time. So last time we finished up here and Alexander had done this and what else do you remember about this? And then you'll briefly summarize what you're going to read about in the lesson to come. You allow students to locate places mentioned on maps if it's appropriate. So this implies that it is appropriate to present proper nouns, including names of persons and places, to prepare the students for the reading. And then you read a few pages of the life slowly and distinctly, reading into the children as much as possible. That's a quote. Now, when you are first starting, you're not going to read a few pages of the life to your kids and expect them to narrate. Sometimes it's just a sentence, at most a paragraph, because as I mentioned, those things are long. So then finally, the students narrated what was just read, and they would take turns in a group setting doing so. So it's really just a matter of setting up the lesson, reviewing what happened before, previewing what's going to happen in the lesson to come. That all takes less than five minutes. And then you do 15 to 20 minutes of reading, stopping for narration after every sentence or paragraph or couple of paragraphs, depending on the abilities of your children. And I just had this thought because this is what I did with my group of students that were such a broad age range, age range difference this past term was I would set up narration groups and I had the group set up so that my new narrators or my shy narrators or my younger ones, they would start the narration. And then my more experienced or my more talkative um, or my more attentive narrators finished things up at the end. So it was just providing opportunities for the students to succeed. Everyone can remember one thing. From the lesson. And so if you go to that person, you know they're only going to remember one or two things or they're shy, and you ask them to give it first, then that serves as a something to jump off of for the next person who's going to carry on the narration. So that's an idea to use when you're doing it in with mixed ages in your home. Yeah. And I, I appreciate your, your encouragement that you can start small. Like I think sometimes I look and feel like you have to read this huge chunk or even I have one of Ann White's guides and some of those are still several pages long. And if you have someone who's just beginning with Plutarch or they're a little younger, I mean, they just start zoning out and they're like, yes. what in the world are yes. like, these are some crazy names and places. I have no idea what's happening. And just that it's okay to break it up in a shorter chunk. That's not being lazy or no. like, just do it small and kind of build your mental muscles. It is absolutely. Those mental muscles do have to be built, but you gradually stretch them, but not all at once. So I've um, heard Cindy Rollins talk about sometimes just reading a paragraph a day in morning time and slowly getting through the whole life in that manner with her family. And um, that's certainly something that moms can do. Not try to read it for 20 minutes, but just read for five or 10. And no, I Go ahead. No, that's it. 
I was just going to say, I so often say with other topics in homeschooling that the simple thing you actually do is better than the perfect thing yes. that you never start. Yes. And I think I've shot myself in the foot still, even though I know that's true. And I tell other moms, it's like, <laughs> I need to remember that myself. Don't go all or nothing. That's Don't right. try to go sprint out and then fizzle, you know, don't yes. try to do it all perfect and then never get around to it. Just we start all small. fall. That's start right. Small. That's yeah. right. We all fall prey to that though. We all do. But I think that we get a paralysis by analysis, by overthinking things instead of, and we lose so much time that way rather than just, just diving in, just starting. Start it. I, I think somebody had once asked Cindy, like, what's the best book you've got to read to your children? And she's like, how, how do I get this started? And she's like, just sit down. And if you think you need to read more, just sit down and pick up a book and read it. Like, yes. don't wait until you pick out the perfect book, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because once you start that first book, then other ideas of books that you'll want to introduce to your children will just overflow your brain and you will need to start adding an hour a day to be able to read aloud with them. <laughs> <laughs> like you, no pressure there. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes mom's voice can't hold up that long, and then, yes. then I love audiobooks. Yes, yes. Well, you've mentioned a couple resources already, and White's Guides. Um, you mentioned Blackies. Is that still around? Are there other resources or uh, guides that would be helpful for moms getting started with Plutarch? Sure, sure. So the um, Blackies guides were, they are rare, hard to find. They are no longer being, they're, they're Blackies editions, rather. So they weren't guides, just they were the edited versions of, um, of the lives. But there are... Um, I mentioned, as you said, Anne White's guides, those are things that I point people to because she's also broken them down into lessons for you as well and pulled out necessary vocabulary and dates and things of that nature. So they're tremendously helpful. I think another thing people get caught up on is the translation. You had kind of mentioned that to me earlier too and and said and asked what the best translation was. And I always say that the best translation is the one that you're actually going to use but Charlotte Mason did prefer the translation by Thomas North, which is more challenging in terms of the language. But she did that because, because of that rich language and the poetic nature of his writing. And another compelling reason why she likely used the North translation was because Shakespeare used the North's translation of Plutarch as the basis for many of his history plays which are examples of how the ideas in Plutarch's lives inspire heroism and greatness, right? So he regularly dipped into the well of the lives to find fodder for his masterpiece, masterpieces. And in fact, five of his plays use the Thomas North translations of Plutarch's lives as a primary source for plot and dialogue, sometimes taken verbatim, verbatim from Plutarch, including Julius Caesar, um, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, Pericles and Timon of Athens. So, but because the language is challenging in North, when I initially started reading it, I did find it helpful to reference modern translations when I wasn't quite sure I fully understood it. So there are several translations like that, but the ones I frequently reference was a translation by Louise Ropes Loomis. And there's a newer translation that I really like by classicist Robin Waterfield. Um, but again, the best translation is the one you're actually going to use. So again, don't waste too much time procrastinating because you can't decide on the text to read. But as to resources, besides Anne White's guides, there are several posts on Nancy Kelly's blog, which is called Sage Parnassus. And in particular, her posts, A Program for Plutarch, and then she has a series of posts called the Plutarch Primer are incredibly helpful. And then finally, I very much enjoy a podcast called the Plutarch Podcast. And it is, oh, it gets even better. The person who is responsible for this podcast is a Charlotte Mason homeschooling dad, Tom Cox. And he teaches Plutarch, among other things, at an all-boys school. Um, and he is just delightful and loves Plutarch and makes it come to life for others. So those are my primary resources I would recommend. Okay, that is so exciting. We, I'm going to have to go add that to my podcast. My podcast yes, is so, it's so great. Yes, it's so great. And it's great for you because then you get a sense of the life before you read it with your children and you can share that knowledge with them. And it helps, again, for us to have that baseline understanding when we're the ones reading it aloud to them. 
Yeah. Oh, that is great. What about, and I didn't ask you this before, so it, maybe you don't have anything that comes to mind, but I think about like with the Iliad and the Odyssey, we think about recommending like children's versions, like mm -hmm. the children's Homer and things like yep. that, where you sort of get familiar with the stories before you read the original. Is there anything like that for Plutarch you would recommend? There are lots of um, lives rewritten, and I can get you a list. There are at least three or four that are kind of like Shakespeare was rewritten for young, the young by Charles and Mary Lamb and Nesbitt and Marchette Shute. They, there were three or four written, the young folks Plutarch. Um, I can't remember the other names, but I can find them for you. But they're really not necessary. They're really not. The more I, like, that was what I was looking to possibly introduce to my students when they were younger, like seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. because I thought, well, we do this for Shakespeare. Why can't we do this for Plutarch? But I feel sometimes with too much of an introduction to the character itself, then they, when it comes to Plutarch, the life of that character, they almost feel like they already know who he is and they tune out. And so they don't get those, dis they don't look at the decisions and they don't look at the consequences and they don't look at the character issues that we really want to use Plutarch for. So I actually don't recommend using them, but they exist. Okay. Well, then we won't even, we won't even put those in the show notes. Okay, we'll good. Start with Plutarch. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until good. you're ready. <laughs> That's right. Don, this has been so great. Thank you for taking the time to chat with us about Plutarch. And here at the end, I'm going to ask you the questions I'm asking every guest. And the first is just, what are you personally reading lately? Okay. Well, I always have several books going at once. So I really had to think about what I was going to talk to. <laughs> but the two books that I'm reading right now that I love the most are The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas and a new one, The Truth and Beauty by Andrew Clavin. So I've read The Count before, and I'm reading it again with my oldest son now that he's a freshman in high school. I knew he was going to like it, but I didn't realize he was going to love it as much as he does, which it's making it all the more fun for me to read again. It's a story of vengeance, but also of redemption. And it was something I knew my son needed to experience in the form of a well-written book rather than as a Sunday school lesson. And the way it's captivated his imagination has exceeded even my own expectations. So we homeschool from January through November. So we're only, we're actually about four weeks away from the end of our second term. But so he does a written narration every single day on some topic. And you're not really supposed to do this, but he every single day has rewritten really a chapter of the Count of Monte Cristo because he loves it so much. And I'm like, okay, yes, just go with that because I had no idea. I knew he'd like it. I had no idea he'd fall in love with it. So it's really fun. And um, The Truth and Beauty, have you heard of this book? I am not familiar with that one. Okay. It came out like maybe a month ago. I've heard several people talk about how much they're enjoying it. But I was like, when I heard it first come out, I was like, I cannot buy another new book when I have so many other books I have to read. But I heard people that I admire very much talk about how much they love it and share snippets. And I was like, fine, I guess I have to do this. So I started it earlier this week and it's really fantastic. And I don't regret taking the plunge. I'm only two or three chapters in, but the premise is that the author is attempting to better know the person of Jesus and his character. And he found he could do through, so through many of the romantic poets that he admires. And so far, his writing is incredibly engaging. He's an excellent storyteller. And the lessons that he pulls out that I would not have thought of are just amazing. It's really, it's, he, he was a secular Jew who came to Christ when he was 50, if I'm not mistaken, it was that was part of his story. And it, it's just really not disappointing at all. And I'm super glad that I, I actually bought it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that sounds really fascinating. And what an amazing story. I think to to see someone with a unique perspective and then to come to Christ at a later age, yes. I'm sure also gives you a unique perspective. Yes, absolutely. Well, Don, the final question I have for you is what would be your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly? Okay, well, praying that nothing happens to screw it up. <laughs> but while I am kidding, at the same time, we really know that nothing will come from our homeschooling efforts unless they're directed and fortified by the Lord, right? So I fear we mamas put too much pressure on ourselves and always think that everything depends on us, including the very characters of our children. 
So we have to acknowledge that how our children turn out ultimately is not up to us. That's God's job, the job of the Holy Spirit, and we're mere stewards. So that is my one piece of advice and encouragement that I would want other homeschooling mamas to hear. But on a more practical level, I find that our best homeschool days are those when I'm not distracted myself. I, I do have a lot on my plate, and so learning to put each item in its appropriate time spot on my part is critical to protecting the atmosphere of our homeschool. So I, I mentioned that I teach um, for Purdue, and so when I have a grading deadline to meet, or if I'm working, I'm writing an article or something, if I allow myself to even let thoughts of that get into my mind, like I did yesterday during school hours, then I do not contribute to a calm or enjoyable atmosphere in our home at all. But when I'm present and engaged, then we're all happy and our studies truly do bring joy to our home. And so making that habit in myself and also helping my sons build habits so they stay focused on their studies during the school day, that helps them by generating tons of free time. They're then able to self-direct in the afternoons when I can work on those other things I shouldn't be thinking about in the mornings. Yeah. And so that's my practical tip. That's both really encouraging and convicting. So <laughs> we're all feeling that pinch of conviction, but that's good, right? Yes. That's the Lord's faithfulness to, to convict us and help us to change. Dawn, where can people find you all around the internet? Oh, you didn't tell me you're going to ask this question oh, because sorry. they can't find, no, I'm just teasing, <laughs> but they can't find me on the internet because I have no presence. <laughs> I, and no, actually, I guess that they can find me at the new masonjar.com yes. and my website, SwedishDrill.com, but I really, I'm not on social media at all. So they can't find me there. You've probably but, chosen the better part, but those I'll put the <laughs> links to those two sites in the show notes. <laughs> Sounds great. I've had so much fun talking to you today. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having me on. Yes, Don, I'm, I'm actually reinvigorated, encouraged to try incorporating Plutarch again, and I haven't failed forever with him. I can bring him back in. <laughs> That's right. You sure can. And Just I start by seven, wives, seven brides for seven brothers. Just show <laughs> that. That's right. And then we'll find a life that matches that. No, but then that's the that's the setup for the life that we're going to choose that incorporates the 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 um the Sabine women. The Sabine women. Yes. yes. Oh, that's. I'll have to start with that one in the fall. Don, thank you so much, guys. If you want to have links to the things we've talked about today and the books that Don has referenced, I will have those in the show notes for this episode at humilityanddoxology.com. I'll talk to you later, Don. Bye. <laughs>